You've been seeing my daughter. I want you to stay away from her. Doesn't Stephen have something to say about that? What Stephen does is his own business, except about our child. Don't worry, Mrs. Hilliard. I'm not interested in children. He couldn't be in love with you. Then he's been giving an awfully good imitation. What are you beefing about? You've got everything that matters. The name, the position, the money. Everything that matters to you. Oh, cut the dramatics, Mrs. Hilliard. I was told you were clever. You must be. To keep Stephen from seeing how cheap you are. Don't give me that innocent bit. I do kicks, you platoons. We both knew a good thing when we saw it. What's the matter, Mrs. Hilliard? Did I hit a nerve? Just a bit of advice. If you're dressing for Stephen, not that one. He doesn't like anything quite so obvious. Thank you. But when Stephen doesn't like what I wear, I take it off. Hello and welcome to Book vs. Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margot P. of ColoniaBook.com and this is my good friend and co-host Margot D. of Book and Fitchick. Hi everyone. It's We are just, it's right in the middle of March. Um, past the Ides <laughs> and uh, St. Patrick's Day was yesterday. But uh, here at Book vs. Movie, that means it's musicals. And not all musicals have been adapted from like a novel per se, um, but in musical theater or actually in theater in general, the script is called the book. So, you know, technically not breaking the rules, although we break the rules all the time around here. <laughs> if you're new, <laughs> here's the deal. We cover films that have been adapted from any literary source. We've been at this for about 10 years now. And we try to crank out a brand new episode every single week. And so that means we can't always do the Joy Luck Club. Um, we can't do your Les Miserables, you know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dune. We, we will we will not be doing Les Miserables in a musicals in March here at Book vs. Movie. Um, so we will consider any film that has been adapted from any literary source as long as um, that literary source is easily accessible um, hopefully, ideally through like a local library kind of situation. And the movie has to be streaming on a major platform. So it has to be ready, easily, readily available for all of us, you and the two of us, to get our eyeballs on. And um, and if that's, that's the case and you have something you think we should cover that we've never covered, please, please give us your suggestions. There's a few places where you can do that. You can interact with other listeners of this podcast and um, just generally like have some fun talking books and movies on the internet. Be sure to like our Facebook page. Uh, we uh, All the episodes are posted there, but we're much more interactive in our Facebook group. It's a private group you do have to ask to join. And we do just talk about books and movies there and some pop culture, things like that. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and threads, all at you have to spell out book versus a movies. That's a place to reach out to us. Or we have an old timey email book versus movie podcast at gmail.com. Send us your suggestion. And if you would like some stickers, just send us your address via email and we will drop them for you in the mail. And if you really enjoy the show and would like to help keep us in books and movies, you can also support us on Patreon. Yes, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We put, like Margo says, we've been doing this for 10 years now. So we have about eight years worth of shows up there on our Patreon wall. Going up there has, what's gone up there recently are My Fair Lady, One Night in Miami, Cats, West Side Story, Cabaret, The Women, The Man Who Fell to Earth and Father of the Bride are dropping soon. So we're just taking episodes from 2021 and then previous to that up on the wall. We really appreciate all of you that support us. You know, it's, it's we ask for a small donation if it's possible and it just helps us get books and movies. But if money's tight or you're looking for another way to support us, just please leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. Just hit the little stars button at Apple Podcasts or Spotify now lets people leave reviews. So if you could do that, that would be great. Really, we really appreciate any time you share the show or, you know, pop in, leave us a comment, leave us a review. It means a lot to us. 
<laughs> Margo mentioned a minute ago that we have the women is up on Patreon now. Listen, we're going to be talking about today. We're talking about a movie called The Opposite Sex. You may not have heard of it. Um, that is because I'm just going to spoiler alert. It stinks. <laughs> it stinks. Uh, nice. <laughs> Not that we didn't enjoy it, but boy, oof. Yeah, it's one of those. And it is a musical adaptation, kind of like last week we talked about Mean Girls, and Mean Girls was a musical adaptation of a film that was a musical adaptation of a book. In this case, we have a musical adaptation of a film that was a musical adaptation of a play. And the play is called The Women. The Women is written by a woman called Claire Booth Luce. We'll talk about her in just a second. But if you have never seen the original movie of The Women, you will not be sorry. Watch the, watch the original. Like if you've ever wondered, if you've ever had the thought, what's the big deal about Joan Crawford? Then you've never seen The Women. Mm-hmm. It's so good, you guys. It is so good. There's not a single man in the cast. And still... It's great. It's it's so ahead of its time. The play, same thing, so ahead of its time. No men in the cast. Amazing snappy dialogue. There's, um, like I say, watch the, watch the original movie with Norma Shearer. Joan Crawford is the baddie. Rosalind Russell, who's <sighs> phenomenal. And then there's an amazing, great performances um, on YouTube of the 90s revival. Also spectacular. Cynthia Nixon. Uh, what's your name? Rue Tilly. McClanahan, uh, yeah. Jennifer Tilly. Jennifer Tilly, yeah, it's, it's in the in the baddie role. Costumes Kirsten by Isaac Johnson. Mizrahi. Oh, it's so good. It's, it's so funny. Oh, so good. It's so much fun. I, it's it's it, we we posted in our Facebook group. It's pretty easy to get your hands on, but yeah, this that's the thing. It's like the sparkling dialogue and these really so intelligent good. women is just like the reason you show up for it. the politics. Yeah. Whatever the sexual politics are kind of dated, but it doesn't exactly pass the bestels test. No, it's not quite, but quite you know. But it's the '30s. Let's calm down. Now, this movie though is much later. I don't know what our excuses are. I can only think it's the. Uh, we've talked about this before. The post-war turn the clock back. But we'll get to that in a minute. We need to talk about the woman who started it all. And we don't have all day. We right. talked about her before, but she is a big topic. We're going to talk about Claire Booth Luce. Yes. So she was born Anne Claire Booth, March 10th, 1903, New York City. She passed away in 1987 in D.C. She was married twice, most famously to Henry Luce, who was a big time. He owned time and life. He created Fortune magazine. She was raised by a mother who first wanted her in show business, uh, but she she was a, a writer. She was a journalist. She served in the House of Representatives. She serves as an ambassador to two countries on behalf of America. She had affairs with people like Ruald Dahl, who she basically sexually exhausted him. He like begged his friends to go out with her. She was almost she almost died by arsenic poisoning because of the castle yeah. she stayed in in Italy. Or was it, you know, germ warfare that she was a victim yeah. of? She was an ambassador to Italy at the time. She was also involved in the women's suffrage movement. I mean, this woman was all over the place. She also uh, famously commissioned a, a friend who um, unfortunately died by suicide. And she commissioned Frida Kahlo, again, a woman artist. Mm -hmm. The woman who wrote The Women commissioned this very famous woman artist to paint a tribute to her friend. Famously, when Frida Kahlo, and it's a very famous painting, when she saw the painting that Frida Kahlo made, she hated it because what she wanted was like a loving tribute to her friend. And what she instead got was a very graphic depiction of the actual event of her friend's uh, death. But, right. I mean, she just such a life of adventure. Her politics kind of go, they swing wildly, like, you know, from very progressive to extremely conservative. Sometimes I really don't get her politics at all. And other times I'm like, yeah, you go. For example, There's- she was like not an isolationist <laughs> in 1939. Right. She really wanted to enter World War II because she knew how bad Hitler was, which was counter to many of her friends at the time. But then later on, she gets the Presidential Medal of Honor from Ronald Reagan. And she's, I think, the first woman House of Representatives, first, I, I mean, so, first true. to serve yeah. in her seat. But she's the first that got one from him. It's, like she said, ambassador to Italy. She was in an open marriage. She had lots of affairs. She had a political life. 
in office, out of office. She, she knew everybody, and she was brilliant. And uh, this play is one of the few plays that she wrote, but it was on Broadway for three years and was a huge hit. It's so good. It's so brilliant. It's such a fun script to read. It's very clever. And it's such a great example, I think, the script I'm talking about now um, and the play. It's such a great example of the show don't tell kind of thing. Like the way the women, they're go- they seem very flighty and gossipy and all that, but they're actually really moving very big chess pieces around um, in each other's lives. Like there's, there's some big stuff that happens. So let's just hit on the, the broad strokes of the plot of the women before we talk about, um, cause there's some big changes <laughs> in this well, movie. Yeah. So we have our, our protagonist is Mary and she is married to who's married. Steven. Steven. He's such a jerk, by the way. I, he's, Horrible. Horrible. What are you doing, Mary? Just kick him to the curb. Mary, yeah, so Mary is married to Stephen. She thinks they're in a loving relationship. They've been together for 10 years. They have a daughter. They're rich, 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 rich. Like, can get $50 manicures in the 1930s. This is another important point about this, the play versus the movie that we're going to talk about today. Although the women in the movie we're talking about today are affluent women, they are. It's a different world But um, we're talking about depression. This is one of the great things about this play. We're talking about depression era America, pre-World War, between the wars. And this is a glimpse into, these are real housewives. This is a glimpse into the ultra mega wealthy, the swans, as we would now call them today, Mm -hmm. the mega, mega wealthy women in a time when women were not allowed to have power, were not very educated. Um, And so all they have to do is they go to the Elizabeth Arden spa all day and they get their nails done and they gossip. And it was a way for the general public to have a glimpse into, you know, this gilded cage, if you will, that these women live in. And so it's a very different world than the movie that we're going to talk about today. Which is funny because it's during, you know, the Depression. But I mean, sometimes you like escapism, too, when you're going through the Depression. This this ran for three years on Broadway. So her she finds out through the gossip that her husband is seeing a sales girl named Crystal Allen. And Crystal sells perfume. Stephen goes in for their anniversary to buy perfume. He gets more than he's <laughs> looking for with Crystal. He moves her into an apartment. Uh, she has an easier life. Yeah. He fully sets her up in an yeah. apartment. And yeah, it's like a it's not like a fling. It's a this is a long term like he's making plans for the long haul here. And Mary is very loving to him and adores him and puts him first, you know, and they have a nanny and they have a cook and they have like it's like it's this like Margaret said, it's like the gilded cage. It looks like it's great, but it's also a time where women can't get their own credit cards. You're not treated as seriously. So they do have, you know, there's there's drawbacks to what they have. And it's also attached to the men that they have. And then so she winds up with the group of women that she knows. They all wind up in Reno at the same time because there used to be the law that you had to establish residence someplace else. Reno was one of those places. So there's a couple of others. Mexico was one, I believe. Yeah, in order in to South. get a quickie divorce. Right. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people did that. So these women are going there and we find out that like one of the biggest gossips, she's getting dumped by her husband. There's another woman and, you know, they with they're in New York and then they go to this ranch in Reno. And then we have the Countess, which is this very extravagant woman who travels with them. It's like her fourth or fifth marriage that she's on. There's a woman that runs the place in Reno and sort of like, you know, we would say now cha- challenges norm, gender norms. And uh, there- yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but these are like Margot says in the original play and in what we saw the production, which I think was like 2000, 2001. It's all women. There are no men anywhere featured. And that because this is the story. This is it's the focus on them. Mary and her husband split up. She's broken up about this. She comes back to New York and she realizes Crystal, complete shock, is a jerk and didn't really love her husband. So now Mary is like, I got to get him back. And so it's all they're all conniving to help Mary win Stephen back, even though she's all set up financially. He's like I said, she's doing fine. She doesn't really need him. Um 
but okay. But she wants him. C'est la vie. Uh, yeah, so it's all a scheme to get her husband out of the clutches of Crystal and back into her arms. Why she thinks he's going to stay there, we don't address that. But uh, it's fine, I'm sure. I'm sure it's fine. Um <laughs> They have a daughter that's the intermediary, or intermediate. Yes, the, the daughter's word. really smart. Yes. She's got really great dialogue. I mean, the dialogue is so good. There's also a character of her mother. And again, it's the mid-30s when this play comes out. And so, you know, the mother's advice is just pretend like you never heard about this affair. You know, just play along. He'll He'll... You've got him for the long haul, basically. He doesn't love um, her. And, yeah. And Mary is like, um, no, I, why would I live with, you know, I, that I, sh- this is clearly over. Like I've been living a lie and, and somehow, I don't know how it is that she comes around to the fact that she, she feels like she's not living a lie or she wouldn't be living a lie anymore or that he somehow has changed. I don't know. The daughter basically, you know, she, of course, doesn't get along with Crystal. She's nice to her as she could possibly be. She's like 10 years old. I mean, you're not going to like your dad's new wife. But uh, Crystal's, yeah, schemer. Crystal's got her own you know, guys on the horn that she's talking to when she's not talking to her husband. And so the daughter is sort of sowing the seeds of like, I don't think dad really likes Crystal anymore. He realizes he made a big mistake. And you're so classy. And you guys had something so special. And kind of like, and that's what gives her the idea of like, okay, I'm going to put on my best gown and we're going to go to this big event and we're going to out Crystal for being a jerk. And then he's going to be like, my wife, my real wife, come back to me. Exactly. Jungle Red. <laughs> Jungle Red. Um, and there's this character, which who we never meet, I don't think, uh, Buck, who is, mm-hmm. he's a cowboy that the Countess has, now in this, again, in the original version, the Countess has picked up Buck as her I forget, fifth husband. And we learn that after Crystal has married Stephen, she's having an affair with Buck, the cowboy. Um, And so all the women get together and they, they, uh, and there's a gossip columnist that, you know, buzzes around these society ladies and they, they manage to, in front of the gossip columnist, out Crystal for, you know, cheating. And, and they get, everybody gets their comeuppance, except for Steven, somehow. Right. Um, the guy who actually uh, did anybody any real harm. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, but that's, you know, but that was the time. That was the time. And Mary is a smarter, more grounded person, we can say. Um, she's she's going into it, I think, with open eyes, it feels like. Anyway, that's that's the end, is they're reunited. Um, Crystal the baddie and the gossipy friend, what's her name? Rosalind Russell. Sylvia? Sylvia, thank you. She gets her comeuppance. A delight. It is so funny. And so, you know, these women are so outrageous. They're so, they have no real actual problems. And so what do they do? They scheme and cheat on each other and, and lie and gossip. And, and that's what happens. It's, like I said, if you've never seen it, just, just, you will love it. I don't know you. I don't know who you are. I don't know your taste. <laughs> but I know that you will love the women. Um, and then you, you may also even love the opposite sex, for, but not because it's good. No. <laughs> Mary believes in romantic love. That's where she is. And I think, you know, she feels like he's going to break up with Crystal over this, right? He may just find someone else to get married to, and that would kill her. So we have no reason to think he's not going to do this again. Right. Zero reason. He he has shown really zero growth. But okay, Mary. But okay, look, it's what Mary wants. That's the story. There's also talks about... You know, once it gets to gender norms, we have a writer that's very, like, never married and, and has a lot of quips about women versus females, which is like a conversation we hear nowadays. And, you know, the schemingness of women and uh, can you trust one or not? And it's all just fun. It's just good, good, silly, harmless fun. And I'm sure it was so much fun to watch live. I mean, I did see the version with Cynthia Nixon. It was fantastic. It's it's not only witty it, it, and full of one-liners and zingers that are so still so funny, so fresh. Um, but there's also a great deal of physical comedy, we mm-hmm. did forgot to say. Um, it is a very physical play. There is a lot of physical oh, sh- um, falls and trips and fights and it, 
it, it's fantastic. In the great performances we were just talking about, and once again, you can get it on YouTube. It's Jennifer Coolidge is like the much pregnant. I forgot about Jennifer Coolidge. Oh. And it's just it's as such a great wonderful. Cast. Yeah. And and the Isaac Mizrahi costumes are just phenomenal. I think he won the Tony Award for that. It, it's they're it's, gorgeous. It's they're fun. so pretty. Yeah. So someone decided in the mid 50s, why don't we make a musical of this? Okay. Okay. So then we have a whole other world war, right? Mm-hmm. And now it's no longer the depression. Now we are in the post-war boom. So a very different landscape. And also women who were gaining more and more agency during the war, as we discussed before, and there's several things that we've talked about. Um, there's like a record scratch. <laughs> <laughs> and we turn the clock back. I'm like, no, 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 miss. <laughs> no, you're not going to be running that office. No, you're not going to be the forewoman of that factory. No, you get to go home now. Go do up your hair and go home and have kids. And um, no, you don't need to go to college. You need home ec. A different, totally different uh, point in the evolution of feminism, let's say, <laughs> you know, very much. Uh, this attempt to get women, you know, back into the back into the home, back into the kitchen, back into the, you know, to an even greater degree than what we saw in the original the women, you mm-hmm. know, the, 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 than what was going on in the 1930s, we could argue. So very, very, very different landscape. Do we play the trailer? Yeah. Just fair warning. It's weird. <laughs> it's long, too. <laughs> Why do men who should know better gape at a well-filled sweater? What's there about it that keeps them craning their necks? Hmm. The answer is the opposite sex. Hello, darling. I'm in the tub, shriveled to a peanut, waiting for you to call. In the tub? It's too bad there isn't a television attachment on this phone. Look, if I can get out a little later on, you take off your spurs and meet me at the car. Now hold it, honey. Can I call you back? I've got some people here I want to talk to. Okay? Howdy, folks. I'm here to give you the bare facts about the opposite sex. I'm Buck Winston when I play in this picture. In person, I'm Jeff Richards. The lucky guy, MGM cast, opposite all the feminine beauty and the opposite sex. Oh, what women. For instance, there's June Allison as Kay. Kay had been a famous singer. On the man with the two front names, Harry, James. The young man with the horse. And Sheridan as Amanda has her own ideas about the opposite sex. Females. The lost sex. Substituting fashion for passion and the analyst couch for the double bed. Oh. Dolores Gray is Sylvia. A good listener when someone's dishing the dirt. Well, you can't blame him, really. You should see this Crystal Allen. Yes, you really should see Crystal Allen. Played by seductive, sultry Joan Collins. Don't give me that innocent bit. I do kicks, you plug tunes. But we both knew a good thing when we saw it. What's the matter, Mrs. Hilliard? Did I hit a nerve? This is Gloria, ready to love, honor, and betray. It's luscious Ann Miller. And here are those riotous four-time losers in the Reno handicap. Agnes Moorhead and Charlotte Greenwood. The opposite sex is spiced with eye-filling production treats, set to the beat of hit tunes and toe-tapping rhythms. Now, now, now. Backed by Art Mooney's band, here's yours truly, old Buck Winston and his guitar.
opposite sex. Mighty popular idea, I reckon. One is here to stay. What is this movie? Okay. What is this movie? I texted you the first time I watched it this week. What? And I said, it's kind of like Orange is the New Black meets RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, that's when they're in With Nevada. The plot. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> it's very camp. I mean, it's, it's... It's super camp. It's super campy. We Well, let me see. We have June Allison as Kay... Hilliard. We had, we renamed okay. some people. I don't know why, but all right. Okay. Joan Collins, by the way, Crystal Allen, great. Okay. She's been out. She's really good. She's she's very well cast in this and she's doing a great job. Yeah. Delor- no notes. No Ms. notes. Collins. No notes. And uh, I love it that her name is Crystal Allen because she fights Crystal Carrington in the 80s. <laughs> and in this movie, she fights. Uh, Ann Sheridan is Amanda Penrose. Ann Miller. You have Ann Miller. In a musical, and you don't ask her to sing or dance. No. One of the greatest no. dancers, by the way, of all time. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. ever. Always is ever. on top she 10 list. She couldn't be Case. Well, we'll talk about the plot, but Oof. yeah. What? Uh. Leslie Neal. Miller- so if you're, keeping, if you're keeping score and you're a fan of the original movie, Ann Miller is playing the Paulette Goddard yes. um, role. Uh, Leslie Nielsen as Steven. We finally get to see Steven. Yeah, he's doing a pretty good job. He's fine. I forget how handsome he was. He's yeah, he really was. Jeff Richards as Buck Winston. He's hot. He does a good job. Yep. Agnes Moorhead as the Countess. That's some good casting. Yes. Uh, again, no notes. No notes there. Sh- uh, Charlotte Greenwood as Lucy. Joan Blondell, who I just adore. Edith Potter. I- love Joan Blondell. She's we don't get enough of her. I love her. And she was Dick Powell's second wife. Mm-hmm. And I think June Allison was the third wife. And <laughs> so they had like a little bit of a he is the one. He was in a lot of things, but um he was sometimes like a cast as a tough guy. He's the original. He's the first person ever to play Philip Marlowe, the detective Philip Marlowe, in 1944, Murder My Sweet. Oh, okay. Um, but he's in a lot of like I won't call them B movies because they're not. They're I, that's not that far. But he does comedy. He does drama. He plays tough guy. He plays leading man. Um, he's just kind of he, he does a lot of things. So yeah, so he was married to. Joan Blondell, who he divorced in 1944, and then married June Allison in 1945. So, overlap. There's there's a little overlap there. Yeah, but they, um, but they he's, apparently he's they, looking. Yeah, and they, apparently they got along fine. They did their jobs. Sam Levine is Mike Pearl. Um, Carolyn Jones is great as the the roommate. She's always, I mean, always a beautiful. She's always great. And then we have you know some musical performances. We have Jim Backus. For some reason, in this biz crazy, what is this number? Like, why? Ugh. Okay, Dick just, Sean. We, okay, and we him. have to. Yeah, we'll just put a pin in Jim Backus for a second. Yeah, um, yeah, we've got J- J- uh, Dick Sean. That's he's the one in the number with Jim Backus. It's a big cast. Lots of men. Lots and lots and lots and lots of men. I just saw they were supposed to have Grace Kelly play the June Allison. <laughs> She really, she really dodged one there. I think. I I think so too. I think, but I mean, it's the same beats. But Mary this time is someone who she's a writer and a singer and a producer on TV, and her husband's in the she's, theater. No, she her husband is a producer. Her husband's a big shot Broadway producer, and um, Amanda is the writer. Um, that's uh, uh, what's your name, Ann Sheridan. So K or Faye, no, K? K. I I keep saying Mary. It's K. Sorry, y'all. It's K. Yeah. We don't know why her name is K. But K was a very, very famous singer who then married the producer and settled down and became the nice little housewife. So she has showbiz past, right? And so all their friends are showbiz Broadway friends. So which is, which is famous and and the affluent, but it's not like on the level of that in the women, right? It's not that's not that echelon. Mm-hmm. It could have been, 
but it's not. Um, so, and it's a musical ish. I mean, it's billed as a musical, but it's not like the first of all, okay, there's not a single song, there's not one song in the whole movie that advances the story one freaking comma, not an iota. I, what are they doing? There's a, um, and it's not like the play is going and they break into song. There are songs because they're showbiz people, so they're like show show songs. Like they walk into his uh, Stevens play that he's producing, which Crystal is in. This crazy number about bananas. I want to be a bananianaire, <laughs> and and Joan Collins and everybody's in brown face for some reason. That was very what? alarming. Yeah. What are we doing? What are we doing? And then Kay and her husband have a party at their place and it's her birthday or their anniversary, but somebody gives them a gift and the gift is her record from 10 years ago. Like they're going to re-release her. Your gift is this. I. So then she, they play her record and she's just sitting there like, oh, I used to do this for a living. And now yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm just sitting around this house. And I'm sorry, June Allison. Ooh, this was not a great performance. This is. What? It's. It is not good. There's it is a, not good. She's wearing she's her hair at some point. Her, she, what? Okay. She has such well, an. That's in, her. That's her. That's her with that hairstyle. That's the sort of like signature hairstyle with the bo- like the weird childish bob with the with the bangs. It like looks, if you look at remember the Depends commercials. She's got yes, the same hairstyle. But it's, it's the like, same hairstyle. But it's like Kristen Wiig when she would do those uh, play on Saturday Night Live when she it had is. the hooks for the hands and she that's ex- <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's what she like that. looks like, and it's distracting it's it is it makes her it's look really older weird, you guys. it makes look, her look plain it makes same. I agree you can... agree she's very dowdy looking which in fairness in the original uh the women norma shearer's mary is very is a very kind of dowdyish sort of a matronly kind of a housewifey sort of a lady okay but later on and oh my gosh it takes or ever for the plot to move along in this movie. I don't understand why it feels so very slow, but it really does. Later on, after she leaves Stephen, she decides, because of course, you know, she's a woman alone and she has to make money. So she goes back to show business and they have her singing this very, like it's meant to be sultry, sexy. <laughs> she's wearing like the equivalent of a, of a flannel completely buttoned up to the neck nightgown. With full puffy sleeves. Peter what Pan is she collar. Peter Pan collar. No sex what appeal. What are you doing? You promise me the world tomorrow Well, frankly, I am not impressed Tomorrow can take care of tomorrow For tonight, may I suggest whatsoever what is this and she has all these cute boys with their bases you know that they're flinging around and she's like singing and i think she's dubbing some of these songs Uh, some of the songs at least one of the songs is dubbed with a completely different person's voice doesn't sound remotely like june ellison who can sing why 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 it's so crazy. This movie is so confusing to me. Um, I don't understand the choices. So I get the, yeah, it just, it's not her best. And um, I don't know why. I don't know. Why did we ch- make these choices? You know, is it's, it because I, I would, when I was watching it, I thought, cause I've seen clips of this when we did the, the women originally, I watched some scenes of this at that time. 
And so I knew that at the end for the finale, when she shows up at the club, she's wearing a very sexy, like that's a beautiful ensemble that she has on. And I'm thinking like, is it a dowdy outfit? This, this show tune that she's doing, is it meant to be like really dowdy so that then when we see her, it's like a big reveal, but literally in the very next scene after the show tune that we're talking about, she's just hanging out at home with her girlfriends, she's wearing such a better outfit than she's wearing in that show number. What is going on? And then there's a whole thing where she takes over the production of a TV show and she's like, we can't get Dinah Shore, so let's get Dick Sean. She DS, is in I guess. charge. <laughs> yeah, because she's... Um, and I'm trying to remember if there's something like this in the original play. I don't know if there is or not, but... All of these showbiz ladies are involved in a showbiz charity and they have a big charity do talent show something or other that they're that Mary is no, sorry Kay Kay. is producing. She's she's in charge of it. Um, and so so it's an added like plot line that as these women are scheming and divorcing and jumping into bed and and uh, all this um, cat fighting, they are also putting on a show. <laughs> And it's It's Dick Sean, who's with his psychiatrist and Jim Backus. And then he's like, all I love is girls, 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 girls. It's like over and over again. It's like he doth protest too much, first of all, if you have to like Like, establish it that much. Okay. (laughs) Got it. Got it, Tom Cruise jumping on fun down on the the sofa. It was very that. (laughs) It's bizarre. Uh, But she does meet... Joan Crawford, um, and then she and suppo- she slaps her, you know, like, hey, you stealing my man. And apparently Joan Crawford thought, or sorry, Joan Collins thought she, that she was not going to actually land her. And, and June Allison thought that Joan Crawford was going to tilt her head back more. So she actually slapped her across the face. The most exciting thing that happens. But, you know, moving it along, they do eventually, she's like, well, I got to break up with you uh, you know he has has a whole thing where he meets the girl he has his daughter meet his mistress at the park and has you know it, it gets a lolly with her and they're like i mean just he's he's why why it's there's like no chemistry between them at all he's, he's trying to make it easy on the kid by like kind of like i'm introducing my new girlfriend while your mom's in the bahamas or wherever bermuda wherever she went off to but mom comes back and finds out that her daughter's already met the mistress and that he's putting her up in a room there's the whole so they anyway they go to reno to and they're all there and actually the reno stuff is pretty fun that's i was just saying i would say that's the best part of the movie is the reno stuff yeah they have like again a, when all the men are gone when all the men are gone <laughs> and they have these women just trading quips and like i said the gender norms are all over the place, but, and there's a great scene where they have a big fight. That's like really exciting. It's Winchell. Gloria Copacabana doll is in the process of being renovated. Three guesses, Mrs. Howard Fowler as to whom she's going to marry. Gloria. A small world, isn't it? <laughs> Why, you dirty double dear no, little... Sylvia, you don't love Howard. That has nothing to do with it. Oh, why don't we just forget it and go to bed? Ah! Here, now. Sylvia, get a hold of yourself. Okay, let's go. Ah! Sherry, don't lose your temper. I'm sorry, Countess. She hit me first. I'm going to let her have it. Ah! Look out, Kate. <laughs> why, you little... <laughs> oh. And then they leave and they come back to New York and we're supposed to really root for Kay to get this guy back. And I think it's the worst idea. It's a terrible idea. It's even worse idea in 1956 than it was in 1936. It's who is this guy? Who did you marry? What are you doing? Stop. 
You clearly have you have a career of your own. You have friends. What are you doing? There are so many other men in 1956. It's I. It's just a real head scratcher. Um, I'm trying to see who was it that did the music and lyrics. It's a, it's like Sammy Kahn. And, yes. Um, I mean, it's not nobody, but like, where were y'all? Did you phone it in? And the one thing I will say is, um, yeah, music by Sammy Kahn, George Fried. I mean, just, okay, for those of you who don't know. Um, Hi, hopes, he's got, <laughs> ha, and uh, call me irresponsible. Uh, I fall in love too easily. Uh, let's see, love is the tender trap. Uh pocket full of, ain't that a kick in the head i love that song <laughs> girls 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 gr- what like dude um it, it it it's it's boggling the one thing though i think that is good in terms of like the quote-unquote musical overlay of this i think the choreography actually is very good in the yeah. um in the numbers and that's by uh robert sydney okay so robert sydney oh yeah robert sydney he was really good at doing choreography for actors who weren't who were graceful, but maybe not necessarily professional dancers. He lived to be ninety eight. Oh wow! Um, and he worked on um, let's see, where the boys are, uh, the singing nun. Oh my god! <laughs> and Valley of the Dolls. That was some great choreography in Valley of it's the Dolls. Good, yeah, right? yeah. I think he he does a good job because again these aren't Joan Collins is graceful but she's not a dancer. Um, uh, what's your name? What's June your name? Allison. June Allison. Uh, hi, I'm June Allison for Depends. Yes. Um, <laughs> she's she can move, but she's not a she. You know, nobody goes dancer June Allison. Um, but he does a super good job. Why oh why did we not break the Ann Miller glass? Don't know, but it it's yeah. It's right from the start. It's weird. Uh, it's just make yeah. It's it's totally is going in a direction that it's 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 doing this whole like ha ah, optimistic overlay when we're supposed it's supposed to be more biting and more yes. and more cynical really and definitely yeah and it's not in a, the most fun catty way yeah yeah it's supposed yeah. The Claire Booth loose lines are why you turn up for it. That's why exactly. people want to remake it because it's funny. And this mm-hmm. is like, I didn't it totally- laugh at all. Seeking stones as bright as stars that glimmer. Why do little silkworms go about their business? To make my lady's limbs just shimmer. Why do those talented Parisian gents rack their brains concocting fragrance and Except no, when they were in Reno, and then I did laugh because there was some so funny bits in Reno. Top. What, what Ann Miller's great. I mean, we're saying we're, we keep we're, we're just mad that they don't let her sing or dance, but she's really good. Yeah. in this, I think she's very funny. She really brings a lot. Agnes Moorhead, of course, of course. Um, and I, I think you, you all, you just don't get that like. Schadenfreude is too far, but you don't get that like guilty real housewives kind of thrill um, with this that you get with the original. Right. Um, There is there's just not that element of like, look at these rich bees up in here, like thinking everybody wants to be them when their lives are a mess. Um, It's not that you don't have that at all in this version. It's. It's too, it's just all over the place. And, um, oh, the little girl, we forgot to talk about the little girl. Um, uh, what's your name? What is oh her name? My. Debbie. She plays Debbie. Debbie. Here, Sandy Desher. 
Yes. Um, who was a very famous child actor. She was in a lot of things. Um, but the one I always remember her from is um, another, another like great eye candy movie, but like the, the writing is so terrible. The last time I saw Paris with I've never Elizabeth seen Taylor that. and uh, Van Johnson, who are supposed to be in love somehow. Oh, it's. It should have been so good, and it's not. But but the costumes and the sets and all of that are gorgeous. And she plays their their daughter. It's supposed to be based on um, F. Scott Fitzgerald. It's one of the F. Scott Fitzgeralds. Not Tender is the Night. Anyway, it's supposed to be based. He's supposed to be based on F. Scott Fitzgerald Van Johnson's character, and it's just it's nah. But um, but it's still a fun movie. Elizabeth Taylor's costumes in that movie are too die for and they are the same costumer who did this movie um helen rose and and i will say that those are my two favorite things about this movie is the choreography i think is excellent and the costumes i have no notes except for june allison her costume except for like what is that, going on that there? baby blue outfit was just, i don't get it what is the baby blue outfit that was just and I, I forgot to mention on patreon you can sign up for free because we do have some free episodes there but i put the clips from the movies because sometimes they don't let me post them on tiktok or instagram mm-hmm. so if you sign up there you could see what we're talking about because we put a few clips there and it's it's just weird <laughs> it's it if it were a different kind of number but it's a very sultry, sexy number. Which and would be perfect for Ann see, Miller. You see her hands and her face. You don't see her neck, her <laughs> ankles. It's not her fault. Like, she didn't say, dub me for this number, you know, unless she chose that outfit. But but in terms of, like, it's really the directing in the script, you know. It's not – I'm not blaming June Allison. I think I think – I don't know who, like, if great, poor Grace Kelly, if she had been roped into that. Yeah. I Who knows what they would have done with her. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty bad. Um, I have many thoughts about everything except the costumes. Uh, wait, what were my things for no notes? Um, the costumes, the choreography, Agnes Moorhead. And um, uh, and Joan maybe, Blondell. And Joan Blondell. And Anne love. Sheridan is good. And actually, Anne Sheridan, you're right. Anne Sheridan does a very good job. Anne Sheridan in the in the original, there's the we talked about how Mary has her mother, and her mother is supposed to be the quote unquote voice of reason, who's lived beyond all this catty drama. Um, nevertheless, she gives Mary the advice to ignore the affair and stick with her husband. And so that role. For some reason, I don't know why Mary can't have a mom in this version, but um, that role is played by Anne Sheridan, who's playing like a, a, a slightly older, although she's supposed to be older, although they're probably the same age, um, than June Allison, but definitely wiser. And she's a, a writer and she's she's the one who's giving advice and observing about the women and everything. And, and, and she does a very good job of it, I think. I wish she had more to do. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that's, those are my notes. I mean, it didn't do well at the box office. It didn't do very well. No, it famously tanked. Yeah, yeah. And so that they stopped, like, trying to remake this movie. I know there's one with Meg Ryan and a bunch of other women. Oh, it's also so bad. Yeah. It's not good at all. I, I, I don't know. I, yeah. That one has even, has even less of an excuse. As far as I'm concerned, um, the Broadway one, though, the oh. Broadway one is so good. And the original, I mean, if you again, if you've never seen it, it's so ahead of its time. And um, it's just it it just sparkles. It's so good. This does not. No, no, you can avoid this. <laughs> the music is I can. All I remember is girls, 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 girls. And um, I like and girls. Song, I like girls. I only think about girls, girls, girls. Like, okay. do okay. That's, that's yeah. Your, we get it. Try hard. Um, <laughs> th- there's a mo- the, a number that June Allison sings with Harry James, who's in yeah. this movie for some reason, and it's a it's a tune. It's not even a new tune. It's a tune that she's saying. In a in another movie, like ten years before, it's just I don't I don't 
who, who, who okayed this? Who signed off on this? MGM. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's how we feel. We do have an exciting <laughs> choice for next week, which we think we're going to enjoy much more. I'm looking forward to it. We're, uh, we're going to be talking about go Matilda. So yeah, starring the lover of Claire Booth Luce. I mean, uh, featuring the lover of Claire Booth Luce, our author today. Um, Rule Dahl is the author of Matilda. We talked about the um, phenomenally good Love movie, that movie. Um, with Danny DeVito and Rhea Perlman and um, Mara Wilson. Mara Wilson, yes. Mara Wilson, yeah. Um, it's a great, that's a great movie. So I'm very much looking forward to this uh, and I've heard good things about the musical, so I I'm heard expecting good things. Great things about the musical, and it's streaming on Netflix right now. So that's what we're going to be doing next. But please, once again, send us your suggestions. We're thinking of doing thrillers in May, mysteries in May. So keep those ideas coming to us. All those places I mentioned at the top of the show. Our email once again is book versus movie podcast. Spell it all out at gmail dot com. And Margo, where can they find you? You can find me online at coloniabook.com and all my social media callouts are at She's Nacho Mama. And where can they find you? You can find me at brooklynfitchick.com. I'm at Brooklyn Margo on Twitter, on Instagram and threads. I'm at Brooklyn Fitchick and I'm at Brooklyn Margo on the TikTok where I do have a few clips from this movie. Sorry if it's all confusing. It's either Brooklyn Margo or Brooklyn Fitchick, wherever you look for things. Okay, everyone, we'll be back soon with a new episode. Thank you so much for listening to the Book vs. Movie Podcast. We're a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You could find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcasts. You could find us on Twitter, Threads, Blue Sky, and Instagram at Book vs. A Movie. Just spelled it all out. We have a Patreon page. Type in their book VS the Movie Podcast tomorrow. where you can find eight years Frankie, worth of shows. You can follow Margot D on social media at Brooklyn Margot and also Brooklyn Fitchick. You can find Margot P at She's Nacho Mama. Thank you again for listening and please be sure to send along your suggestions for the show. Remember, the book needs to be easy to get your hands on and the movie has to be streaming on a major platform. We will be back soon with a new